Hiya! Welcome to this, my 55th episode of Video Fuzzy. I'm your host, Terry J. Amon, sifting my basket of media memories, and in this installment, titled The Art of Failure, I feature the pilot episode of Sons of Anarchy. Uh, in my classic collection, I find an HBO documentary and artist Chuck Connolly, and in my current collection, Fall Premieres, Channel Zero, and Quite a Lot of Psych. Welcome to the show! He doesn't have that on video, does he? We'll find out together on Video Fuzzy. After updating my recorded drop-ins last time, I got after a project I've wanted to follow up on for a good long while now. I, I put my supporting artwork for this project together when I started back in 2017. I felt the picture of me pulling a DVD from a VHS tape was a good representation of this project and the love and magic I find in it. And it still is, but I felt like there was some value in going a little more abstract. I felt the retro font and TV feel is the right speed for this project, and the beard motif reinforced that aspect of the title, a, a big furry cuddle bear sifting through his DVD collection up here in the Northern Plains. Oh, we got hit with that reality this past week up here. A freak October blizzard put a lot of snow on our roads and a lot of cars in the ditch. It was already melting away here and there, and projected highs in the 50s through next week will keep it from hanging around, but we got slapped with a nice reminder of where we live and what's coming next, that's for sure. Decided, or the weather decided for me, I'd write this one up from home and venture out more once the weather improves. Friday Night Feature On disc 754, I ran into the first episode of Sons of Anarchy to turn up anywhere in my collection. Actually, the pilot episode, which I felt made it an excellent candidate for my Friday Night Feature. Kurt Sutter, uh, creator of The Shield, which I think I got into late, but I did very much get into. I, I loved his Machiavellian take on cops and criminals and depends on who's asking. Uh, but in 2008, Sutter shifted his focus to a motorcycle club, largely Caucasian, in the fictional town of Charming, California, geographically mid toward Northern California, San Joaquin County-ish, maybe too far north for okay from their pilot episode. The first moments of this production, a rival motorcycle club called the Mayans, largely Hispanic, have rolled into their territory, broken into their warehouse, stole M4 guns, the Sons of Anarchy Motorcycle Club, uh, Sam Crow were selling to another club, the One Niners, largely African American, and blew up the warehouse with a few undocumented migrants hiding inside and left for dead. The the episode tracks the club's response to this outrage. Well, it tracks the club's response to several outrages. The warehouse explosion by the Mayans, a bunch of neo-Nazis cooking and attempting to run meth through Sam Crow territory, particularly to the pregnant junkie ex-wife of one of them, a nightclub double-booking Elvis impersonators. I know, you'd think, like, choose your battles, right? But they're choosing all the battles, uh, along with tremors originating among the founding members of the club itself. Charlie Hunnam plays Jax Teller, a young, charismatic, freakishly handsome biker, vice president of Sam Crow, and officially son of late founding member John Teller. Ron Perlman plays John's friend and club co-founder Clay Morrow, current love interest of Gemma Teller, Jax's mom, played by Katie Sagal. Jax is feeling a bit sentimental these days because his ex-wife, Wendy, is just outrageously pregnant with his son, and looking for baby clothes and stuff in Gemma's garage, he finds old photos and writings his dad created up. Where in his dad's vision, the club should be a kind of Harley commune, felt the extra-legal gun-running operation was a mistake. And yeah, far as anyone knows, John's accident, getting hit and dragged for hundreds of yards by a semi, was a complete accident. But Gemma's kind of a hard-ass about it. Well, she wants to make sure Jax is more along the lines of the operation as Clay is running it, rather than the fairy tale idealized by her late husband. Jax gets yanked from his trip down memory lane with the news that Wendy has been found passed out on the kitchen floor in his home, OD'd on crank. At the hospital, Maggie Siphus Tara is the doctor in charge of Jax's son, Abel, born ten weeks premature with congenital heart and stomach trauma they need to repair surgically. Gemma confronts her junkie ex-daughter-in-law, Wendy, in the hospital about fetal abuse nearly killing her grandson, and Wendy's all, Please don't be mad at me. I couldn't handle it. The pregnancy, the loneliness, everyone hates me. Being a single parent is all too much. And Gemma's like, yeah, Shut up, you dumb whore. If you make one single move to take custody of that child... Oh, never mind. She passes Wendy a syringe full of heroin, and quite according to plan, Wendy ODs. 
As his son is undergoing surgery, Jax tracks down the dealer who sold heroin to Wendy and beats him bloody. On top of that, Sam Crow later meets up with the dealer's supplier and tells them to steer clear of Charming. Clay also had to meet with Leroy Wayne from the One Niners in the aftermath of the mines hit on their warehouse and the gun shipment that they won't be able to fulfill. Wayne gives him another day, but that's it. Else his club rolls the streets of Charming, causing trouble. Despite the Mayans pulling this heist, and presumably on high alert for retaliation, well, it's possible they're not expecting one. Maybe they don't know that one of the Sons of Anarchy, Juice, is also part of the Borg Collective and a human Google and can hack into criminal databases. Christ, it's got to be good to have one of those around. Hell, yeah, found exactly who hit him, where they took everything, gonna grab their guns and blow them sky high. Except that they were actually hanging out at the warehouse after hours, just in case someone were to try stealing all the guns they stole. So the sons also had to kill some folks, make it look exactly like arson, or arson mixed with an execution. I, I'd love to hear the medical examiner's report on the Maya, and they positioned face down, pants down in the back of the pickup all the dead bodies were stuffed into with a stick of dynamite up its bum. Well, this fellow was clearly not practicing safe sex at the time of the incident. Indeed. The bikers beating up the Asian Elvis impersonator so that Mark Boone Jr. as their crewmate Bobby Elvis can sing his usual nightclub booking led to a musical number, Can't Help Falling in Love, which played over the final moments showing Wendy ODing and the Mayan crew's incineration, Tara letting Jax know Abel is going to be okay, a shirtless Jax cleaning himself up in the hospital washroom, then in fresh clean scrubs marveling at his newborn son. Gemma joins him and says, he's perfect. Clay drifts into view behind them and the screen fades to black. The energy of the piece is Kurt Sutter right down to the floor. Pilot episodes have lots of work to do in order to set the stage, introduce the main players, and in the case of Sam Crow, there are lots of main players. Try to shoehorn in enough story that we give a crap. And in the case of Sons of Anarchy, they managed all of this. The club meeting fleshed out some personalities, histories, and interactions, and introduced a new member, Half Sack, kind of a derp, uh, caught a buck through his windshield, and then kept the head in a box under all their pool table, maybe to stuff and mount later. Dumbass. As for Jax, he had split from Wendy, and all the women of Charming know this, and they are ready to swoop in and comfort him. He's even returning some of their smiles, but he's actually got some history with Tara, his boy's doctor. It's only hinted at, mostly when Jem is talking to her, points out that she might have completed her residency, but she's still got a tramp stamp. That was weird interaction. For sure between Wendy and Tara, Gemma would have a preference between the tramp who nearly killed her grandson and the one who pretty much saved his life. But it was more for us, anyway, uh, to let us know Tara's a doctor, but a young one, and she wasn't always. At the end, when she's giving Jax the good news of Abel's recovery, there's definitely some history and some chemistry there. I barely mentioned the bedroom scene between Gertrude and Claudius. Oh, oh, sorry, I mean between Gemma and Clay, talking about Jax listening to the right father, or the meetup between Hamlet and Horatio, or rather, Jax and Opie. Storylines diverge, but when Jax dug up his father's writings and we cut to Gemma and Clay, parallels are at least present, and I think that's why I glommed onto this biker gangland turf war so completely. It had a decidedly Shakespearean flavor to it, tracing power, family, morality, everything they had at stake, complete with young lovers navigating cross-currents in different worlds. It's great storytelling, and not too surprisingly, in the hands of these artists, made for great television. At least through the seasons I followed it. I liked the season arc storyline that pitted the sons against neo-Nazis, led by Henry Rollins. I, I was less interested in the Ireland storyline. That seemed like, where the hell are they going with this? By the time I moved to Bismarck in 2012, I pretty much lost interest in the spiker drama, but most of the seasons I did watch, I enjoyed. <laughs> Cross connection. Oh, incidentally, in episode 54, I mentioned thinking that Mary McCormick was in the final season of Sons of Anarchy. Nope. Well, maybe. Hard to know. Never watched much past season 3. But, in fact, around that time, the club was beset by a tenacious ATF agent, something or other, June Stahl, played by Allie Walker. 
not Mary McCormick. What was pinging my memory so hard was Ali Walker played Violent Crimes Task Force profiler Samantha Waters through the 90s, and I can't swear it's anywhere in my collection, but I enjoyed following her adventures tracking Jack of All Trade serial killer through most of four seasons of Profiler. By the end, they'd clearly run out of ideas, but for sure, for at least three seasons, the show had my attention, and Ali Walker was a huge part of that. So, seeing her show up in the last season of Sons of Anarchy that I actually watched was just, well, that was really fantastic. Allie Walker is not hard to track through Studio Six Feet Under. I, I've got her in Boston Legal with Ed Bigley Jr. from Six Feet Under. Seems about as direct a match anyone would need. The profiler, it, it looks like, featured some people who went on to star in Nip Tuck, including Julian McMahon and Roma Mafia. And along with Walker, Mafia and Profiler cast member Gary Anthony Williams also appeared in Boston Legal, so it was cool to see how they got their start together way back when. One of the pieces I'm looking at for this one is an HBO documentary called The Art of Failure, Chuck Connolly Not for Sale, and I was like, oh, crap. Yeah, tracking documentaries through Studio Six Feet Under can be rough. It's true that the documentary included footage from Alan Coppola Scorsese's New York Stories, featuring Nick Nolte as an artist, and Connolly appeared in that movie as Nolte's hands, but that's a little like saying Michael Chiklis is in the third season of Legion because of that clip Noah Hawley pulled in from The Shield, and more on that in a bit, but no, for me, tracking from that doc means tracking from the IMDb cast listing, and that was challenging. Digging up from a documentary is a job of work, but this is what I found. The Art of Failure featured Aaron Gorski, whose one other credit is in something called Black Flowers, with Christina De Rosa. She was in Blackish with Anthony Anderson, who was in The Shield with CCH Pounder, in The West Wing with, oh, just to be different, Matthew Perry from Studio 60. How many steps was that? Four? Five? Jeez, uh, back in episode 46, I tracked grizzly bears in the Alaskan wilderness more directly. Well... To be perfectly fair, Chuck Connolly is a credit in this documentary. He is also credited in New York Stories, which gets me to Mark Boone Jr. I just talked about him in Sense of Anarchy. He gets me to Bradley Whitford in Plain Sight, points to Studio 60 in really not so many steps after all. Calling up a little old business. I had been talking last time about Mary McCormick in reference to misremembering her as having appeared in The Shield. It didn't happen, but having brought it up, see, I flew right by it while the show was on, but in episode 4 of the third season of Legion, chapter 23, right when they're introducing the Time Demons, producer of that show, Noah Hawley, included an iconic, if completely non-sequitur, scene from The Shield, uh, one I talked about in episode 8 of this podcast, the pilot episode, in fact, from 2002, where Vic Mackey's interrogating this child abductor and molester. He sets up a mini-arsenal on the interview table, and the world-weary pedos like, what, now it's your turn to play bad cop? Vic looks him square in the eye and grins, Nah, good cop and bad cop left for the day. I'm a different kind of cop. In the original, the interrogation ends in a confession. In the Legion reprise, the scene time shifts and fast forwards through the beatdown as the time demons chuckle, shifting back to the episode of Legion already in progress. But yeah, one thing that stood out in the scene that they pulled in, they blackboarded, they changed the aspect ratio to highlight it as an older production. I pulled it up to look at in my current collection copy on disc X260 so as to compare it with the recording I've got in the pilot episode of The Shield on my classic collection disc 317. The monitor I'm using, that recording is full screen. I think they just needed it to register with the viewers that we were watching something older highlighted as being from a different show. The reason I thought they might have included it was as another definitively FX production, grounded in gritty, physical realism, not remotely genre. Vic Mackey doesn't experience time jumps or time loops, but in the scene we saw, he did. Time kind of rolled up on itself by the end, kind of the way it does in that episode of Legion. And... It strikes a contrast between the kind of storytelling Kurt Sutter was doing in The Shield and the kind that Noah Hawley is doing on the same network in Legion. Albeit 15 years later, for sure, but absolutely it stands out. Never mind The Shield, I'm not seeing Legion-style storytelling much of anywhere. But, but sure. Effective. Hmm. Diving into my classic collection. I was talking about having encountered The Art of Failure, Chuck Connolly, Not for Sale, an Emmy Award-winning HBO documentary from 2008 on Disc 760 in my classic collection. Chuck was, 
presumably still is an artist, works in oils, from what I saw, has a great eye for disrupting social norms, allegory. His his pieces tell some of them a really dark story, and his life feels like one of them, uh, like he climbed into one and got lost. One thoroughly mishandled scene, they ran toward the end, where he was moving his paintings around, and he was just exhausted, passed out on the floor in front of one of them. I, I don't know in a documentary how much the cameraman is allowed to set up a scene, but when he fell, how he fell flat to the floor, surrounded by his artwork, it was absolutely perfect. And what the idiot film editor did was iris out. It's like, wow, you had this iconic shot, perfect closing shot for the whole piece, and you star wiped it, you hack! This this wasn't the only instance of the film editor doing art. Uh, the Emmy they won was not for editing, that's for damn sure. But most of the rest of it was pretty darn good. Uh, considering the exterior camera work was handheld, shaky, the interior, sometimes it was just him and his wife, uh, by the end ex-wife, putting the camera someplace and it, it shot what it shot. But director Jeffrey Stimmel, I don't know how many miles of film he had to wade through to get what he got, but he knit together a pretty good story of this artist who achieved some success in his younger years, late 20s, early 30s, it sounded like, painted some art, sold it for tens of thousands of dollars. Later, as the documentary begins, Connolly and his wife are watching internet bidding for his art, topping out at a couple few hundred dollars, hardly worth shipping it. He is enraged, he is incensed, his soul, his truth to sell for so little his wife scolded him for thinking negative thoughts, that's why the bidding was so low, but I'm actually on his side on this. A positive, negative thoughts, he painted what he painted. The bidding was going to be what it was, whatever he thought, whether even he watched it or not. The documentary included comments from gallery owners he worked with, and over time they came to dismiss Connolly's outrage, which, as they spoke, seemed somehow less and less unreasonable, honestly. But one of them, kind of looked like a bat villain, was saying how Connolly sold a piece in the 80s for tens of thousands of dollars, and in his mind, that means that all of his pieces are worth tens of thousands of dollars. Another, who offered him a few hundred for a nice piece to match his decor at the top of the stairs, then later stepping away from that offer, and when Connolly was insulted by this behavior, suggested that he paint a picture, put it in an oven at 400 degrees, and then try to eat it. These were not especially nice people, including Connolly. I mean, oh wow. Simmel filmed his wife trekking from gallery to gallery, trying to get him a show, trying to get his pieces displayed, get them sold. He just screamed at her and everyone. It's obviously frustrating. I mean, this guy's work, it's so clear just from what they included. He has a gift. It's undeniable. These pieces. He goes representational. He goes geometric. He paints cartoons possessed by demons. He, he is not afraid at all of scope. He paints... My god, he had this piece in his apartment, which means somehow it was not sold, but it's the broken ark, Noah's ark, and it shows the animals tumbled out onto a lush valley. There's everything happening, and what caught my attention as the camera panned by was a fox looking mischievous, and I was like, whoa, all of these creatures he depicted just reacting to the whole new world they find themselves in, just, just in those few brush strokes, less than a second, and people are somehow surprised at his unwillingness to approach these pieces as commodity, to maybe just parcel them up and sell them as art by the pound or something. I, I get it. He's dark. He's difficult. He's he's unreasonable. The, the title of this documentary is from a cab ride with another artist he felt she was selling her art too cheap. Said he isn't willing to sell himself short. She shouldn't either. Her pieces are worth more. He's willing to flip the script, tell people, oh, that's not for sale. Turn down what he feels are frankly insulting offers. I mentioned scope. There was a piece they included near the end that looked like potentially rooftops in the moonlight, just gray polygons on black. Looked like cities and cities and cities. It looked like, no, not with anything approaching this precision, but it, it was like looking at Escher by way of Leo Leone. The, the math in these pieces, the, the emotion in the eyes, this, this face they included halfway through the piece, he painted enormous feminine eyes on the most implied feel of a face. It was arresting. The man, it was, it was like his whole life, as presented in this documentary, was a torch ablaze, Olympic, rests one Promethean glimpse at his potential, and in the next moment, clamp down life, reality, the terrifying smallness of his prison, surrounded by magnificent visions so full of meaning and energy that won't sell for the carrot scarlet pulled from the earth, and he's trapped alone with his canvas madness. If you can't hear my empathy for this guy, you're not listening. 
Yeah, he'd have been a little more diplomatic, shut his yap sometimes, got along to get along, played the gallerists' games. Of course he'd have had more success. Taking control of one's own definition of success is itself a means of achieving it. I just think, watching this, how much of anything is true, but that this guy had his truth, he developed it through the years, learned how to present it, had the talent necessary to present it on canvas in his paintings. He was unwilling to compromise that truth, show the world what it thought it wanted to see from one painting to the next. The flipbook images at the end of the piece, I ran the frame advance on those, gotta say, yeah, there was definitely some truth in there. Really happy I found this piece in my collection, and Chuck, wow, man, good work, all strength, and dude, take care of you. In other finds, I barreled through what I recorded of the 2008 Republican National Convention, uh, Sarah Palin's address, John McCain's address, the video tributes. It's, it's good to have records, and whatever one thought of his policies, Senator McCain was a class act right up to the end. As with the Democrats, I also recorded a lot of The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and The Colbert Report. Good to have, I guess, but in retrospect, not totally necessary, so I didn't spend an awful lot of time on that. One image caught my eye as the GOP ran a video tribute of the 9-11 attacks, closing with a largely still image of the Twin Towers, but for reasons I'm certain made sense to someone, when editing it together, a seagull in the upper right-hand corners clearly seemed to be flying backwards through the shot, and... I just don't know why they'd need to have cut it together like that. Seriously, they could have just included it as a still image and the bird wouldn't have been in shot at all. Why run it backwards? Just weird the stuff you notice, I guess. I also found The Medium, in which executive producer Kelsey Grammer makes an appearance as a sinister purchaser of life insurance policies on cancer patients testing new drug treatments, mostly unlucky ones, as it turns out. I also caught episodes featuring Emma Stone and Mark A. Shepard, and a season one episode that created and featured a golden age of television production called I Married a Mind Reader. Kind of dark, kind of fun. In other cool cameos, I found the Will and Grace featuring Bernadette Peters as Karen Walker's sister. Then Eric McCormick from Will and Grace I finally saw in the third and final appearance of his character arc in Dead Like Me. Uh, coincidentally enough, he also appeared as a local talk show host in a copy I found of Mr. Monk's 100th case, which that seventh season episode of Monk was flooded with cameos and callbacks to prior seasons and fantastic celebration of the character, I imagine. I, I did not pull that one up to watch again. I just kind of fast-forwarded it. It looked fine. They they did fine. I also found the My Name is Earl for season finale, where Earl let Crabman pick a list item for him to try fixing. Crabman picked list item number one, and oh no, was on investigation, it turns out Earl stealing $10 that morning was the difference between him getting the winning lottery ticket and his victim, Paul. Earl tracks down Paul, who, by the end, we learn already had the winning lottery ticket and all the bad karma that came with it, including the old lady running into him with her car who also ran into Earl, and the lottery ticket floating around the town of Camden, nudging people along their karmic path, a reasonably fun retrospective on the first season, before Paul tracking Earl down and insisting that he take his winnings back. Nothing but bad luck, that's what he was having. The... Episode also showed Earl trying to make up for his past wrongs in whatever ways he was able without the lottery winnings, which was cool. He he could make up for not dancing with a girl at prom for free, for example, and when he was desperately broke and sold his car, he still prioritized his debt to Paul, much to his brother Randy's dismay, so clearly he intended to do the right thing by karma with that money. Looking back on it, there was such a parallel with The Good Place in that episode, doing right even when it's difficult, for no other reason than because it's the right thing to do. That made the show stand out to me, for sure. Looking at what else turned up, I spied Tyler Labine's appearance as a prosecutor in an early third season episode of Boston Legal. He looked fantastic. And I recorded the season two finale of The Office, where Pam learns that Jim is in love with her. On disc 751, I think this was a complete coincidence, but I recorded the second ever episode of NBC comedy 30 Rock, titled The Aftermath, followed by the second season fifth episode of CBS crime drama Criminal Minds, also titled Aftermath. Ooh. Probably just a thing that happens if you're archiving absolutely everything and in no particular order. 
I will say, watching the late sixth season episodes of The West Wing on Bravo, the campaign run-ups to Ellen Alda as Senator Arnold Vinnick as a moderate California conservative coming out as the GOP frontrunner against a brokered convention for Jed Bartlett's successor on the Democratic side. The -the behind-the-scenes view this show could provide, original air date circa 2005, added a layer of interest to the actual campaigns and conventions I was watching at about the same time. There was one point during the 2008 GOP convention C-SPAN was airing an overhead view, I saw a staffer suddenly leap to and just haul ass backstage to avert some crisis or another, and I was like, I probably wasn't supposed to notice that, but since the whole event came off without a hitch, probably whatever that guy did worked. Good on him. Finally, I'm not going to pull up a separate movie tag for this, but just ahead of the Chuck Connolly documentary, I turned up some of the most delicious black exploitation I have ever seen. Eddie Griffin is Undercover Brother, a 2002 romp featuring, if you saw nothing else, Eddie's full-to-the-brim orange soda held perfectly steady as his gold 1975 caddy convertible spins out of control down the boulevard he is made entirely out of cool. Along with Griffin, Undercover Brother, a Comedy Central presentation I completely forgot I had, featured Chai McBride, Gary Anthony Williams, Dave Chappelle, Neil Patrick Harris, Chris Kattan, and Anjanou Ellis as Sister Girl. Holy Christ, what a fox. And since I'm kind of keeping an eye on where all she turns up, I saw Denise Richards was in this thing as well as White She-Devil. Fresh from her appearance as Bond Girl nuclear physicist Dr. Christmas Jones in The World Is Not Enough, but somehow missing from all all three Austin Powers films. Shagadelic. Checking out my current collection. I guess I could have pulled up a movie tag for this one because I snagged a ton of movies this time. I'm not sure they need a lot of comment, though. The FX production of Rough Night from 2017 was probably the biggest surprise of the lot. Quite a good time, gotta say. Lots of reasons to believe that if this wasn't a screwball, coke-fueled romantic comedy, I hope those people would be in prison, maybe. But no, I, I had a lot of fun with it. I think ScarJo, maybe comedies aren't her absolute strongest, but she was surrounded with people who knew what they were. People like Jillian Bell and, um, well, Kate McKinnon I enjoyed so much more in Ghostbusters. This, it could have been such a good time. I mean, the stripper and then the other stripper the, oh boy, when the police showed up, that was, uh, yeah, okay. The, the, the plotting was so screwball that Jet Ski and the swingers and that truck driver sure, yeah, you know what? It's going to sound like I'm not recommending this, but moving on, moving right on. So many other movies showed up in my current collection. I I pulled in the Burton Schumacher Batman franchise, uh, mainly so that if I ever want to watch Michelle Pfeiffer run around in a cat suit, I can now. I I know it's in here somewhere. It will absolutely turn up in my classic collection, but now if I want to see any of them, I know exactly where they are. Not that I'm likely to want to watch Batman Forever or Batman and Robin ever again. I'm Chris O'Donnell, Robin in his 20s, and Alicia Silverstone is... Batgirl is Barbara Gordon, niece or sometimes daughter of Commissioner Gordon, not Alfred. How? Wow, just the inside of my head just exploded when I saw that. Okay, I could go on for days, but... More to the point, I've got them all, and they're all there, and yes, every portrayal, every adaptation draws on an ever-evolving source material, but... Oh, for Christ's sake, she's a redhead! Since we're here anyway, I admit I am entirely unaware of the source storyline grounding the new CW production of Batwoman, which premiered this past week. Uh, Apparently Batman has vanished from the Gotham skyline for three years, but most of Gotham's vigilante crime-fighting services are now provided by the Crow paramilitary security operation run by Jacob Kane. His daughter, Kate Kane, Ruby Rose as Kate Kane, has been off training with a native elder character who wasn't even named, and maybe scripted by whoever wrote for Jay Silverheels as Tato, training slash abuse by way of Pai Mei or anime dojo master Kotsuji. Kate's stepsister Mary, who Sensei has no name, calls talks too much, contacts her via sat phone to tell Kate that her military school sweetheart, Sophie, has been abducted. First, Mary, is it? I mentioned about Kate being off in the woods somewhere, actually getting handcuffed and sunk in a frozen lake, in fact, as part of her training, that's what he calls it, with Chief Heart of Stone. Too slow. 
That's what he said when she clawed her way through solid ice because he'd covered the hole he dropped her through. And did we mention that the lake was frozen over? Yeah, she's busy rescuing herself from this training slash attempted murder. But uh, yeah, Mary, uh, your dad runs a paramilitary operation whose task it is to provide security for Gotham. Uh, never mind, never mind. Sophie's in danger, so Kate to the rescue. Turns out Sophie was abducted by some anime-inspired Alice character and friends, all dressed in gray. And as the pilot episode unfolds, we learn has a special connection with Kate. Sisters? Cousins? Everyone's always related in these shows. Kate and Beth, now Alice, had special necklaces with rubies or something. When the girls were eight or nine, Kate and Beth and their mom or whatever were run off the road through a guardrail above a raging river. Through Batman's intervention, Kate managed to escape, but the other two were not so fortunate. She hasn't made any of these connections yet, however. She's just trying to save Sophie. On returning to Gotham, Kate snuck into Bruce Wayne's old offices for security footage that might point her in the right direction for doing this, and first finds Luke Fox, a haplessly outmatched security guard, and then finds the secret entrance to the Batcave, making the connection that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Over Fox's pointless objections, Kate helps herself to some ordnance and tracks down Alice, who drugs her, and she wakes up in an abandoned clinic where I think it was, in fact, Mary is looking after her, apparently serving as the Meredith Grey for Gotham's down and out. Her encounter with Alice gave Kate a clue, however, and she goes after her again, this time rescuing Sophie and saving the Gotham Gala that Alice was planning to blow up. No sooner has she rescued Sophie, however, than Kate meets Sophie's husband, one of Crow's security operatives or something. She's stung by Sophie's lack of acknowledgement of their history, but powers through it and returns to the abandoned bat cave. She tells Luke she's going to need some alterations to the bat suit. It's perfection as is, he protests, and she smirks. It will be. Yep. I called it. And I called Nancy Drew, too. I watched about ten minutes of that one, and it's like... Whoa. A dead body outside a diner during some town celebration, where the four guys she showed up with plunked down at a table after closing time, so yeah, that's not going to draw any attention to whatever the hell they're up to. And her husband just sent a plate of food out to her, and waitress Nancy Drew just happened to have been recording video out that very window to catch the fireworks. Just, how much disbelief are you expecting me to suspend here? Well, the shows are just pouring out of the CW superhero story mill, and yeah, sure, it's cool to watch this proto-Batwoman facing down this live-action anime Alice with psychotic break already in progress, but I really don't have to. I I've got so much I'm already watching, and so much archive still in need of cataloging. Putting this all in the right order, I hope, I'll, I'll close out with the series finale of Preacher, which ended after four seasons. Was it a little rushed? Well, kind of a little bit. I, I think if they'd split at least the final episode into two or three episodes, probably the last 20 minutes would have made more sense to me. Hot issue throughout the series is Genesis. Who's got Genesis? The, the word of the Lord compels anyone who hears it to follow to the letter. It turns out there's a lot of room for loopholes. God's commands can be filtered out via noise-canceling headphones. If you don't speak the language, you get a pass. It only works if you got a soul, etc., etc., etc. When that power left heaven, it turns out God was free to do whatever he liked. And for years, what he liked to do was dress as a Dalmatian and ride Harleys around the U.S. and attend sex parties. On the eve of the apocalypse, when Humperdew tap dancing Christ is going to go on television, everybody's either going to repent or go to hell, the preacher, Jesse Custer, gets on TV and tells everyone who's watching to shut their television off. There's a fight with a killer saint, God runs away, All Father Star runs away. Oh, that was brilliant. After Star confessed having lost Humperdew and asked God for help, he is restored to physical perfection, complete with his rich, lustrous blonde hair. The cops track him to a golf course, but he shoots them and buries them in a sand hazard. Preacher and Tulip hook up, they have a daughter who meets up with Cassidy 40 years later and they talk about them. World clearly didn't end, everything's pretty much rocking along as per usual. See, Jesse at some point posts that Nopocalypse confronted God about 
his being an emotionally needy little so-and-so, gave us free will but still needed us all to love him. Jesse refused and set Genesis free, loosed it into the universe, saying he didn't need it anymore. God returned to heaven to find the killer saint was waiting for him. Wait, weren't you in a hell ha deathbed confession to a preacher? God tried to smite him, but instead took a bullet between the eyes, and the gunman took the throne. That's a lot, right? It felt like I mean, it was longer than the usual episode, but the show, and I didn't even mention Arseface busking downtown, or Hitler and Christ's epic throwdown they spent almost three seconds on, and then Christ, we see him later selling paint at a Home Depot or something. I really could have watched one or two more episodes of this show. Maybe that episode where the whole thing was Tulip pretending to be a member of the Grail to sneak in and rescue Cassidy, or that torture porn episode they've spent with Cassidy just being worked over the whole time. We could have maybe had less of that and spent more time on, oh, hey, any one of a dozen storylines they were resolving in the finale. But that said, given this series was based on a graphic novel, and given what happened to Deadly Class and Happy, I'm just pleased Preacher, which... I felt was a fantastic show throughout. I was just glad it had a chance to end on its own terms. Well done, guys. Then I'll talk about Superstore and The Good Place. I think they came back reasonably strong. Superstore maybe less so. I, I was sorry to see Linda Porter as a series-long staffer Myrtle had passed on. Uh, Dina's being a little tough to read in that everything she does to torture Garrett, none of it is going to bring her birds back, and... Yeah, he was selfish, but who brings all of her birds to a break room at work and puts them in front of the vending machines? If not Garrett, someone was going to let the birds free, and since it was a plot point in a different episode, were there supposed to be cameras in the break room in the first place? This past week, though, I, I gotta say, adding Dina's nemesis Colleen to the mix was a brilliant move and really woke the show up for me a lot. Well done. As for The Good Place, the concerns I had in the series premiere largely resolved with the second part of it. They they aired it as part one and part two across two weeks, and it's mostly because they did have so very much groundwork to lay in that their demon sleeper agent getting unmasked so easily felt like a throwaway. I, I'm a little sad that Chidi's ability to summon books at will, I saw the joke coming from as far away as the book traveled, but I, I loved the moment they gave with him and Simone, convincing her that maybe if on the off chance this whole experience wasn't just all in her head, she might want to behave more decently to people. The thing that really stands out is the D-bag, Brent. He figured out if this is the good place, he belongs in the better place. He's so entitled, and I don't think any of us will have any difficulty at all imagining references and parallels to people we encounter in our world, but the sticking point is... The bad place sent him for this experiment they're running to see if humans are actually redeemable, and where they left it, end of episode two, he was trying to earn brownie points to get into the better place, which, since his motivations are craven and self-serving, none of those points are going to count. This past week, Tani helped dig into John's issues with fame and gossip, and how an obsession with celebrity can hurt on either side of the velvet rope, and Eleanor tortures Chidi, forcing him to lie about Jason. Wonderful production. Just just wacky fun. I, I saw where sci-fi was gearing up for Halloween with a re-airing of Channel Zero, Candle Cove, and four seasons into it, I guess I wanted to see what I had been skipping. I was right to do so. The, the six episodes of the first season could so easily have been four, and even then they wouldn't have made as much sense as one might prefer. Essentially, a child psychiatrist, Mike, returns to his hometown where... While he was growing up, he and his twin brother, Eddie, encountered bullies. There had been a series of unexplained murders as well, child murders, loosely coinciding with the mysterious broadcast of a low-wattage children's production called Candle Cove. The marionettes and puppets portrayed pirates on a pirate ship, and they had adventures that, among other things, loosed a pirate skeleton called a Skin Taker. As Mike reconnects with its family and friends, he tries to find information about this production, can't find much evidence. His mother confirms that Eddie made up the show completely. Uh, when he thought they were watching the show, the screen was actually blank. The set wasn't even turned on sometimes. And Eddie has an extra tooth, and Mike's daughter encounters a child made entirely out of teeth. Turns out to be Eddie. I guess the best source of all this is Eddie was bullied, and he lashed out at his tormentors, and the skin taker got stronger. By the end, Mike is passed out and talking to Eddie in his head, convincing him to free Mike's daughter, who 
convinces Mike's mother to kill him while he's passed out, but first she has to go through a teacher who is convincing a new crop of children to kill people, and the teacher's trying to kill Mike's mother. You know what? This story makes less sense than stuffing three or four Stephen King novels in a blender and forcing a bot to stitch together a story from the resulting chaos. Maybe they get better, but if this is what you led with, I will step away. I have no confidence you'll do any better with haunted houses, cannibalism, or a Nightmare on Elm Street knockoff. By comparison, coming back much stronger than past seasons, Murph's American Horror Story 1984 returned with a lot of new faces and fresh energy. Margaret Booth, apparently the sole survivor of a psycho slash attack by Mr. Jingles in the early 1970s, purchased and reopened the summer camp where nearly everyone was attacked and killed. Mr. Jingles was apprehended for murdering a cabin full of campers and collecting one ear from each of them, including Margaret. Now in the present day, 1984, seeking to escape the pandemonium of Los Angeles during the Olympics and the threat of the Night Stalker, five fitness and flirtness freaks accept counseling positions at the reopened Camp Redwood. They're all young and hot and horned up and high on the booze and the pills and the drugs, and Margaret is not having it. She's running a good Christian camp, and her counselors need to behave themselves. Her rules go unsurprisingly ignored, but a bigger issue is Mr. Jingles, locked away for his slasher crimes at an insane asylum that's just unbelievably nearby, while he broke out with some assistance by psych student Donna Chambers, posing at the camp as Nurse Rita, and, oh yeah, the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, followed them up there too. American Horror Story wouldn't be American Horror Story without clever plot twists, and we've already found a few worthy of the series, including Jingles Night, when posers cosplay the hack and slash from the 1970s. As he encounters them, the real Mr. Jingles has a few opinions about that. And along with the low-level dread that there's a killer on the loose and we're all isolated in a no-fun Jesus camp, they're running into some supernatural weirdness as well, some ghosts they've awakened from the original attacks, and... Oh yeah, as of this past week, a little demonic possession as well. Murph has explored a fascination with serial killers before. In the Season 5 Hotel, they had a Devil's Night celebration that presented Eileen Warnos, uh, John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and he cast someone else as Richard Ramirez for that one. Evan Peters played psycho-serial killer James March, well, the, the ghost of him. And he went on to play Charles Manson, Jim Jones, Marshall Applewhite, David Koresh in Season 7 of the series. More cult leaders than serial killers, but there's certainly some fatal associations. Along with March, Murph crafted a few other serial killers of his own, including Dandy in Season 4, the recurring Bloody Face character from Season 2. I mentioned March and Mr. Jingles, uh, Delphine LaLaurie, I believe, from Season 3, along with Marie Laveau, and, of course, Twisty the Clown. There's a range there of people who are serial killers and people who just kill a lot of people. I think the difference is probably in compulsion, uh, drive, the motivation behind the killing. If the killing is incidental or if it's satisfying a need unto itself. But technically, Cody Fern as Antichrist, Michael Langdon from Season 8 qualifies, but yeah, a, a fascination with serial killers, real and otherwise. This is certainly the right series to explore it, and this season is off to a great start. The 80s references, the clothes, the hair, the whole opening sequence reimagined with laser light show graphics, aerobics, pastels, not to mention this was a great decade for hack and slash horror films anyway, with Jason, Freddy, Michael Myers, Hellraiser, Evil Dead, just tons of great references to draw on, and Oh, wow, all of the nostalgia feels they strum in with the 1980s soundtrack. Murph knows how to weave music into a storytelling, and he nails it. People have been down on the series for a while, but watching it so far, I think they listened to the critique and came back strong. I know I'm enjoying it. Speaking of coming back strong, it looks like God's plan to forsake the world and flood it with the souls of the damned it somehow got limited to a one-mile radius when the Winchesters teamed up with an odd, ancient spirit hopped into the dead body of slain Nephilim, uh, Jack, in the 15th season opener of Supernatural. Most of that was holdover from the season 14 closer. The bulk of this premiere was damned souls in Hellspawn possessing dead bodies in a graveyard and climbing out to attack the Winchesters and also terrorizing the town of Harlan, Kansas. 
A few things that make not a lot of sense is why the demon-possessing Jack is so keen on helping the Winchesters, uh, how the magic he cast is containing the ghosts, uh, how do you send ghosts to hell when they can just hop right back out again, and where are they going with all this? They showed a few big-name ghosts terrorizing Harlan, including the woman in white and John Wayne Gacy, ghosts possessing mirrors and cell phones, so standard horror fare. I think the big deal at the end was the realization that if God has abandoned the world, Sam and Dean plan to fight for it. Containing potentially billions of damned souls and demons to Harlan, Kansas, it does get the show off to a dramatic start. I, I'm interested in seeing where they're going with all this. Otherwise, closed out the third season of BoJack Horseman on Comedy Central, mostly enjoyed it, especially where Sarah Lynn called Diane Wynn a sort of Asian Daria. I had not seen that. I caught a bunch of Wee Bear Bears episodes, caught some of the new season of South Park. Uh, you guys have fun. I'm going to sit that one out some more. And, and I'm not really even enjoying the tenth season return of Bob's Burgers this fall. I, I don't know. They'll surprise me, maybe, but it feels like they've done a lot of what they can do with these characters. I, I'm not giving perfect harmony or bless the heart. Jeez, just looking at it, it's like King of the Hill and Squidbillies had a meth baby. No, nothing like a chance. Seriously, it reads like red state pandering and a little gross, actually. And along those lines, it looks like I'll be skipping a second season of God Friended Me, and yeah, I wasn't looking to add much this fall anyway. One thing that did stand out, however, from my discussion last time, it was a hard toss-up whether I'd enjoy the FXX live-action animation short production called Cake. And having actually watched it now, the verdict is in, and it is decidedly mixed. The live-action pieces are interesting, and they've got a nice energy with decent plot twists, but the animations, the, the ones where you can even discern a storytelling goal, that is hit and miss. I'm still drawn to it because I was always a fan of liquid television on MTV in the 1990s, but some of these things just have a terrible case of weird for the sake of weird. There's parallels, there's life lessons, sometimes there's just weirdness, but for the most part, calling it. I I've seen two episodes of this thing. I'm going to stick with it for now. Uh, yeah, Cake on FXX. I'd, I'd go with, let's call it a, a hedged recommendation. Finally, I've archived a few six-season episodes of Psych from their having aired on the Hallmark Movies and Mysteries channel, and I'm so glad I ran that long list of Sean's nicknames for Gus in my episode 48 so I could be listening for it. And in the episode Here's Lassie, where Detective Lassiter moved into what seemed to be a haunted condominium, Sean introduced Gus as Felicio del Toro, but when they rebroadcast it on this channel, they'd edited it to Del Toro. What can you say? The wheeling was a lot freer in the original USA Network broadcast. Didn't hurt the story, but it certainly didn't help, and I, I'm wondering how they'll handle the stripper bus. Oh, deep cut, that was actually from the season 7 episode, D's Nups, which they, for reasons, they barely rebroadcast any of that season in the set I was recording, so never mind. As of the Autopsy Turvy episode featuring French Stewart and Kate Micucci, Kurt Fuller as medical examiner Woody can't even say half-assed. <laughs> and, and with that, thank you so much for checking out my video cataloging project. You can check out my catalog listing along with audio links at videofuzzy.blogspot.com and past episodes at Apple Podcasts. Feedback is always appreciated. You can contact me through my blog or podcast sites via email or through my Video Fuzzy page on Facebook, or you can Follow me at TJ Video Fuzzy on Twitter. For Video Fuzzy, I'm Terry J. Amon. Happy viewing. It might be amazing. It might just be scuzzy. We'll find out for sure the next Video Fuzzy.